Hey, boaters, it's Thursday night. This is Jim live from Nashville, New Hampshire, and this is Raymarine Live. Thanks for joining us again for our latest installment. Tonight, it's Everything Elements. We're going to be talking about our element series of combination GPS and chart plotter products. So I have a, a whole range of element displays here, uh, all the different sizes. I have some transducers, some accessories, and we're going to talk all about all the different things that Element can do. Um, we'll talk about how it's uh, slightly different from our Axiom series. That's a question that comes up all the time. And we'll also look at the different ways that uh, Element can integrate with other Raymarine products. So I want to thank you all for joining us. And for those of you who are watching this after the fact on YouTube or Facebook, know that at any time you can put in a question or a comment. Uh, we'll pause periodically during the broadcast and take some of your questions. We love to take product questions here. Uh, if you have element questions, we're going to prioritize those. Uh, but that said, feel free to put any questions in the queue that you want, and uh, I'll try to take whatever you throw at me. Um, so we'll uh, we'll get going here in just a moment. Um, so element series. Um, Let's talk a little bit about it. Uh, it comes in three different sizes. Elements are uh, combo units. They have GPS and sonar in them. We actually have two variants of Element. There's Element HV and Element S. So what's the difference between those two units? Um, element HV is targeted at people who like to fish. HV stands for hypervision. And it is a high frequency version of our side scan, uh, side vision, down vision, and real vision 3D that gives you a extremely crisp, clear image at shorter ranges. Um, so we'll take a look at some hypervision images uh, in a moment. Um, it also has our traditional uh, high chirp sonar um, plus side vision and down vision, uh, also in 350 kilohertz chirp. We'll talk about all those different capabilities in just a moment. So I mentioned there's another element out there, element S. Uh, the S stands for sonar. Um, so the element S is a combo unit. It has GPS charting and it has high chirp sonar in it only. Uh, could you go fishing with an element S? Absolutely. Uh, it actually is a pretty capable down looking uh, high chirp 170 to 230 kilohertz uh, down looking beam. Um, but the Element S, we primarily uh, designed it for uh, small uh, cruising boats. So that could be uh, sailboats uh, that want a nice uh, basic navigation product with sonar built in. Uh, it could be a rib or a dinghy, um, uh, any kind of uh, small lake boat or runabout. Um, Element S is a great choice. Maybe fishing isn't your thing, but everybody, every boater needs to know how deep the water is. So it's got sonar built in, uh, and it is a very capable unit. So... Um, the uh, element, uh, the, probably the number one question we get when we talk about element is what makes it different from an axiom. So let's uh, let's address that right up front. So element uh, comes in three sizes, seven, seven inch, uh, nine inch, which I have on the product cam, we'll show you in a second. And it also comes in a 12 inch uh, display. Um, and that actually mirrors the uh, axiom plus line. Those also are seven, nine or 12 inch screens. So the number one differentiator between an element and an axiom, the elements are not touchscreen products. They are actually uh, button controlled. So you can see uh, here on our display, we have a nice uh, big full color LCD, uh, but down the uh, left side of the product, this side, I'm looking at it in the camera backwards, we've got buttons uh, and dedicated keys for a lot of the functions uh, on an element. Um, elements also have uh, a slightly simplified operating system. Um, they run a derivative of Lighthouse 3, so it's very similar to an Axiom, but it's called Lighthouse Sport. Uh, so what we have done is we have kind of simplified uh, the operating system, um, really uh, targeting it to uh, fishing or sailing or cruising or whatever your primary feature is. Um, we have stripped away some of the super advanced features. You know, there's, there's no drone integration in here. There's no augmented reality in here. Um, but as far as navigation, uh, as far as uh, radar capability, it is a pretty robust system. And of course, the sonar uh, is really stellar uh, in this product. Um, so let's take a close up look at an element display. Uh, we'll bring it up here on the product cam. This is the nine inch uh, product. I'm gonna back out here just for a minute so you can kind of see the whole the whole thing, a little dark, but there's a nine inch. 
Uh, this is the most popular uh, element by far. So here we are looking at the element home screen and you'll see that it looks very similar to a Lighthouse 3 home screen on uh, an Axiom. And it is a very similar operating model. Um, so you have tiles. Uh, the tiles can be configured into various apps, either full screen or split screen. Um, there are actually additional uh, home screens to the left and to the right. Um, we'll look at those in just a minute. Over on the right hand side now we have uh, button controls and many of them are dedicated to particular functions. So for example, we know that anglers uh, and cruisers for that matter uh, do tend to drop a lot of waypoints, but especially fishermen, they like to mark their catch, uh, mark when you get a fish on the hook. So we made it super easy to do that on Element by giving you this big orange dedicated button, touch the button, it drops a waypoint instantly. It doesn't matter what mode of operation you're in, anytime you touch the orange button, drops a waypoint, saves it into memory. Uh, we've got a home key that's always going to bring you back to the top screen here. Uh, this is a menu button, uh, obviously a directional pad, back button, OK to select any menu items. Plus and minus, these are your range controls when you're in the chart. This is your zoom in and zoom out when you're in the fish finder. And then down here, you've got uh, presets, one, two, and three. Now, these are something that you won't find on an Axiom, uh, but you have them here on Element and Element S. And what these do is these enable you to designate your three favorite tiles and gain instant access to them. So if you look out here on my home screen, this one here called running has a number one in the corner. So it's assigned to button number one. Uh, this one called casting is in button number two. This fish finder combo is preset number three. So these are kind of like my three favorite radio stations in the car. So it doesn't matter what view I'm in. Anytime I press uh, preset number three, I'm going to get um, whatever screen is set up uh, for number three. I, I don't have to go back to the home screen. If I want to go to favorite number one, I just touch number one and it instantly loads it up for me. And of course, if I want to go back to the home screen, I can touch the home button and, and here I am. So this is um, a pretty neat feature. It's nice to be able to jump uh, right to a favorite page, um, you know, particularly when uh, you're running fast, you're in a small boat, you're bouncing around. Um, so it gives you that, that capability uh, instantly. If you want to reassign these presets, it's actually very simple. So up here with my directional pad, um, I just select whatever tile uh, I want, and then I press and hold the button. So I'm gonna hold down number one, and you can see now quick launch has now been assigned to this guy up here. So now anytime I press number one, I'm gonna get the chart and the dashboard. So I mentioned on this home screen, um, there are additional tiles available. So here's kind of the main uh, center uh, home screen, but if I go to the right, um, I actually have six more positions where I could program in additional tiles, and I can also go to the left, and again, six more tiles where I could program uh, whatever I like. So what is a little bit different on an element versus an axiom is how you program the tiles. So um, we're going to press uh, and hold down our OK key, and um, in the case of an element, we have actually already defined the layouts for you, but you'll see there's actually quite a large library uh, of preset selections here. So you just pick uh, whatever tile you want to appear in that position um, and press the OK key. And now, for example, I have a top and bottom fish finder combo. Um, I could add additional ones here and fill this up. And again, with the directional pad, I can go back to the center. I can go back to the right. I can keep adding um, uh, screens as I like. Um, and those three favorite screens could be anywhere across those 18 tiles. So you pick your top three on whether they're center, left, or right. Um, you have instant access to them uh, all the time. So um, a few other things that are out here on the home screen. Obviously, we have our GPS uh, position um, element like Axiom has an embedded GPS receiver. It actually sits right behind the Raymarine logo here. Uh, it works pretty well. It's a very sensitive uh, GPS. Um, you know, with any type of embedded GPS receiver, it does need to have a fairly clear view of the sky. Um, the small boats that Element is kind of engineered for typically have uh, pretty open uh, configurations. Um, if you, for some reason, had a very challenging installation, if you put an Element below decks, for example, on a boat and it was fully enclosed, or maybe it was in a metal pilot house, um, you can uh, use a network GPS sensor like a Raystar. Uh, 150 um, over SeaTac NG. We'll talk about networking in a second. Uh, but the embedded GPS on this is a, a really nice one. Uh, and I think for most applications, you'll find it works just fine. 
Um, we know Element gets used in a lot of smaller vessels. Um, they are often run on battery power. In fact, um, uh, TWC popped a uh, question in uh, this afternoon um, about um, running an Element on a lithium battery. I know a lot of customers do that. I actually do it myself. Uh, I am a kayaker uh, when I'm not here at Raymarine, um, and I'm out on the water with Raymarine product all the time. Um, I use, in fact, to answer your question, PWC, since we're here, I use a, a 10 amp hour lithium battery pack uh, to run my element, and I can usually get about an eight hour fishing day uh, out of it. Um, there's some pretty good ones out there. The one I use is a Nakwa pack, but there's certainly others out there as well. Um, so definitely check that out. So you have a battery indicator right here, so you can tell what the battery voltage is that's feeding the system. There is actually a battery alarm that you can configure as well, so it'll alert you when your batteries are getting low. Um, if you uh, have this on a small boat, maybe you've got electric trolling motor and a lot of other goodies running on it. Obviously, you don't want to drain your batteries down to the point that you're not going to be able to start your motors. So having that battery uh, voltage front and center and having the alarm enabled as well is, uh, is pretty nice. Uh, we've got a clock up here. We've got a status indicator. And then we've got some other basic high-level uh, functions down here. We have our waypoints menu, routes and tracks. And in here, we have um, all of Elements uh, system settings. Um, let's take a look in that settings menu just for a second to show you some of the things that Elements uh, can do. And again, you'll notice this looks very similar to a Lighthouse 3 Axiom product in its layout. So you can find a lot of similar controls in here. So right on this first screen, it reports to us the software version that's in Element. This one is running the current version 3.0. 13.76. If I wanted to upgrade Element software, um, I can do it one of two ways. Um, this unit does have Wi-Fi in it, so I can either go online using its Wi-Fi and update it direct from Raymarine server, or I can plug an SD card in and take software uh, that way. You can download it from Raymarine in advance, put it on a card yourself, plug it in, update the software. It works great uh, either way. Again, here's your language selections, uh, type of phishing, all that sort of thing. Um, the next tab I want to call out that is rather important oops, when we're setting things up is the boat details tab. Um, Element does do auto routing. If you're running Navionics charts, if you are running CMAP charts, um, it can do automatic routing. Uh, but in order to do that, you do have to have this boat details top portion filled out. So we need to know the height of your boat, the minimum safe depth of water that it can route you through, and the minimum safe width so that if there are bridges or other real skinny areas along the way, it knows what the beam of your boat is so we don't get you stuck anywhere. So if you want to do auto routing, uh, make sure those features are filled in. Um, the rest of it is pretty straightforward. Here is your uh, preferred units. Um, here is some display particulars. Um, there are color themes on Element. You can go light or dark. Right now, this one is in light mode, uh, but if we shift it to dark, then uh, you're going to see, obviously, a dark color palette. Imagine that. That's dark mode. Um, I'm going to go back to light mode because it actually works a little bit better with our studio camera. Um, if you're integrated with an electronic compass, you can calibrate it from here. Uh, if you have other NMEA 2000 devices connected to your network and say you want to get GPS from somewhere else or you want to get wind information or whatever, you can choose your data sources. Here is your alarms menu. Um, this works with AIS. Of course, you get shallow depth. You get waypoint arrival. There's your voltage alarm that I talked about earlier. So a lot of the uh, main uh, navigation and status alarms are all in here, and this is where you can control everything. Um, this does have the ability to uh, back up waypoints, routes, and tracks, just like all of our other products. So it has an import-export feature, so you can back up your files. Uh, bring things back in from an SD card. Um, the data format that Element saves uh, into is exactly the same as what Axiom does. So you can uh, exchange waypoints. Um, Element actually makes a great product. If you have a big boat with uh, Axiom and you have a dinghy that you tow behind or you carry on your swim platform, Element is a great navigation system for your uh, dinghy. And you can uh, synchronize your waypoints periodically uh, so that everything the big boat has, the little boat has as well. Uh, lastly, I just want to point out the Wi-Fi uh, menu in here. So Element units do have Wi-Fi, as I mentioned. You can connect it uh, to the internet. Uh, presently, that is used for software updates. 
Um, you can connect mobile devices to Element, but not quite in the same manner as Axiom. Um, we have a mobile app in the works called Ray Connect. You may have seen us mention it in the past um, as part of our Lighthouse Charts program. That Ray Connect app is going to work with Element when it's released. You'll be able to store Lighthouse Charts in Element's memory. Um, so all of the framework to make that work is here, and this is where you could set up that mobile device integration. Um, I believe you can also set this up to work with the Navionics mobile app. So if you want to transfer waypoints and routes between Navionics boating on your iPad or Android device and into Element back and forth, you also do that through here. And finally, um, Element is radar capable, though it only works with our quantum radar and it only works with a Wi-Fi connection. Um, there is no physical plug-in for radar on an Element. You're always going to use a Wi-Fi connection on it, but it works great. Um, I do recommend going with the, um, the, we have the Quantum and then the Quantum 2. Um, most of the time with Element, you're better off using the original Quantum. And the reason I say that is the Quantum 2 is the Doppler radar, uh, but Element can't do Doppler. Uh, but it works with the basic uh, Quantum radar quite nicely. Uh, so if, if you're shopping for an Element and thinking about adding radar, go, uh, go Quantum original flavor. Um, you'll get the most bang for your buck that way. Let's pause for a second and see what we got for questions. I see quite a few of them coming in. Um, we're going to try to prioritize element-related questions and get those first. So Charlie would like to know, can we explain the new sonar chart live on the chart plotter? Where does the data save? Sure. So uh, sonar chart live um, is a function of Navionics charts. And what it does is it allows your system to build uh, bathymetric charting on the fly. It uses your GPS position and it uses the depth readings from your sonar. And in real time, it will build uh, depth contours at a uh, one foot uh, interval. The data is saved to the micro SD card that is plugged in to your unit. Um, so if you're running Navionics Sonar Chart Live, um, it is saved to your Navionics chart card. Um, you have the ability through their subscription platform called Navionics Freshest Data uh, to upload that information to Navionics, where they will actually combine it with other users of the system's data, um, and they um, will then feed it back as chart updates to the bathymetric chart layer on your fishing charts. Now, I should mention that there is an alternative built into Element and Raymarine Axiom as well called Real Baffy. So Real Baffy is another live chart generator. It is a uh, Raymarine engineered product. Um, and what is interesting about Real Baffy is it actually doesn't require a subscription of any kind. Um, it doesn't even require a map of any kind. All you have to have is a blank SD card plugged into your product and you can tell it uh, where you want it to save. Um, it'll, it'll go to the card uh, on an element, because that's the default uh, place. It's, it's got one card reader on it. On an Axiom, you can tell it which card reader to go to. But anyway, the data gets saved to the card. The map gets built in real time. Um, and it works very similar to Sonar Chart Live in that you're going to get that one, one foot contour interval. Um, and that layer can be turned, or, turned on or turned off at will um, and displayed on the chart. Uh, what is neat about either of those systems is it allows you to go through an area and rapidly update the bottom if conditions have changed. Maybe there was a storm or a hurricane blew through and churned up all the sand or added a lot of debris to the bottom. Uh, so you can update the chart very quickly that way. Um, maybe you're uh, a freshwater fisherman or an inland fisherman and you're fishing a pond or a lake that has never been charted before. Uh, you can actually drop your boat in and very cautiously proceed around the waterway with Sonar Chart Live or Real Baffy running and build the chart as you go. Uh, so a pretty cool technology. Uh, what else we got here? Jamie would like to know, what is the best trolling motor to pair with Element HB9? Does or will mapping and waypoints sync and control the trolling motor? Uh, great question, Jamie. So um, Element can't control a trolling motor, uh, but we can, um, we can connect up to the embedded transducers in both Motor Guide and Minn Kota trolling motors. Um, they, those manufacturers both offer trolling motors with a built-in uh, transducer uh, in the bottom of the trolling motor. So we do make an adapter cable accessory, one for Minn Kota, one for um, uh, Motor Guide. Um, and you can utilize that built-in transducer if you want to with your element. It runs through the uh, high chirp uh, channel on it. 
And let's see, we got one more in there. Kevin, Kevin, yay, finally our screen mirror update. This is probably the number one most requested feature for Element. And I know a lot of people that look at Element probably used Dragonfly previously. And Dragonfly had that really cool feature where you could link it with Wi-Fi to your phone, see everything that's going on um, on your phone. Um, if you're doing small boat fishing with somebody else, even kayak fishing, you could do like kind of boat to boat stuff where I could see his fish finder if he was within Wi-Fi range. Uh, so some pretty cool stuff. Um, Element does not presently have that capability. And we know that you very, very much want that capability. And trust me, I do too. Um, so I will continue to make the case to get that going uh, in the product. But for now, uh, unfortunately, it is not there. Um, though a lot of the parts needed to make it happen are there in the product. We'll see, uh, we'll see what happens. But I promise I will keep pressing for that, Kevin. All right, let's talk a little bit about the physical hardware on Element. So while we've got the product camera up, I am going to swivel it just slightly. And let's look at the back of an Element display. So this is the big 12 inch display. And what I wanna show you here is it's got a relatively simple set of connectors on the back. So this is our uh, power cable. Um, it actually uses the same power cable as an Axiom or an Axiom Plus. Uh, it is a uh, small uh, twist lock connector. And actually, I'll show you what it looks like on this one. Oops, a little more cable, please. There we go. There it is without the uh, connector plugged in. Um, so you can see it locks in there very positively. Uh, it is keyed so that it is uh, impossible to plug it in the wrong way, unless maybe you take a, a hammer or a mallet to the back of it and then you're on your own, good luck there. Um, but that is the, uh, the power connector. That is also a NMEA 2000 connector. So Element does have NMEA 2000 connectivity and there's a pigtail on the power cable um, that you can connect into the NEMA 2000 network. And what would you use that network for? Um, that would be for connecting to an autopilot or an external GPS or an AIS receiver. Or if you're on a sailboat, if you have depth, speed, and wind instruments, uh, you can connect to all of those using uh, NEMA 2000. Uh, if you have a VHF radio on board and you want to enable its digital selective calling uh, safety system, uh, you can connect that to the NEMA 2000 network and it can get GPS from Element. So it's a pretty important connection and you can do quite a lot with it. Um, another thing you can do with it is if you have more than one element on your boat, you can link them together with NEMA 2000 um, and they can actually transfer waypoints over NEMA 2000 uh, back and forth to each other to keep uh, data in sync. Um, keep in mind that NEMA 2000 is a lower bandwidth network. So it is mainly for moving data around, things like GPS, wind speed, water temperature, waypoint information, uh, engine uh, information can also come in on NEMA 2000. You can have uh, up to two uh, engines um, register on an element system. It does have a dashboard uh, for that. Um, the, um, but elements do not network in the same way that axioms do. So with an axiom, I could have, you know, 10 axioms all linked together and they all share the radar and they all share the sonar and they all share the charts and cameras and all the other accessories. Um, elements don't do that. They are primarily designed for single display, small boat installations where element is going to be the big screen on your helm. Uh, so they don't have that, uh, that sharing uh, capability, but they do have basic NEMA 2000 connectivity. So they work with autopilots and instruments and things like that uh, quite nicely. Um, so I wanna show you um, one other connection on the back here. We'll go back to the product cam for a second. Let's talk about transducers. So I mentioned there are two different flavors of element. So this unit is an element S. And this has a nine pin uh, transducer connector. So this element only has high chirp sonar in it. And it works with any of our CPTS transducers. Um, so if you have a, um, again, like a, a sailboat or a cruising powerboat, you're not a fisherman, but you do wanna know what the depth is. This is a great product because it has that built in sonar. You can pick a transducer, uh, plug it in here, um, and you have some great capability um, ready to go. If we look at this element, this is an element HV, and you'll notice that its transducer connector is 
a little more populated than the other one. This is a 15 pin connector. So this supports our hypervision transducers. So this has high chirp like the element S, but then on top of that, it has down vision, side vision, high chirp, uh, real vision 3D, um, plus it has down vision, side vision, and real vision 3D in hypervision 1.2 megahertz. So we got a lot of pins to support that. It's a little bit bigger connector, different transducer. Um, beyond that, on the kind of the physical backside of these elements, let me stop shaking the camera around here. You guys are gonna think I'm falling apart. Um, if you look from the backside of these, um, these are engineered like all other Raymarine products. These may be, you know, the entry level products in our line, um, but they are certainly not engineered like entry level products. You'll notice they have a pretty beefy heat sink here, so they dissipate heat quite nicely. Um, this is a fully waterproof uh, display. Um, it is IPX6 and IPX7 uh, rated. It is actually submersible, um, so it will survive the elements quite, uh, quite nicely. Uh, hot water, cold water, rough water, and everything in between. Um, another thing I just want to point out on the front of every element. There we go. I forgot to, when we were on the front to point this out before. So here's your power button here, uh, but you'll notice you got a little tab that we can open up. Sorry, let me set the camera down because I need two hands so I don't drop the display. Pull the tab, we pull the little rubber bung. All right, and there is the card reader. So elements have a single micro SD card reader on the front. Um, there's also, you see a secondary power button underneath. So just kind of nested together, but you put your map card uh, in here, um, just like on um, Axiom, this supports uh, high capacity uh, micro SD cards, uh, micro SD XC, um, standard micro SD. So you can go all the way up to the big, 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 big cards if you want to on here, if you think you have a lot of data to store. Um, that's no problem at all. Uh, but that's where the card reader is on an element. It is front mounted. Um, we have them out here on brackets, but these are surface mountable as well. You may notice the corners of element actually have rubber caps. And if I just spin it around so you can see the opposite side, um, there are holes whoops, behind those caps. Um, so you could actually mount this in the helm of your boat, secure it from the front with a screw, and then the rubber cap uh, goes over it. Um, all the hardware to do that is included with element when it ships. So let's look at some transducers on my giant show and tell table here. Let's start with Element HV systems. So this is an HV100 transducer. Um, we'll go back to product cam for a second for this. Let me see it up close. So this is an HV100. So this is the deluxe transducer offering for an element. We have it in a transom mount as shown here. This is also a convertible transom mount. So this whole top section is called the carrier and it comes off um, and you're left with just a flat transducer block. Uh, we do offer uh, a mounting bracket accessory so you can bolt this to your trolling motor uh, if you want to. You can also, I believe, step mount it onto a flat surface um, and eliminate the transom bracket. Um, if you're a kayaker and you're gonna run uh, element in a transducer well or in one of those kind of pull out uh, transducer, fish finder, carrier cases. Um, this does fit into uh, most of those systems quite nicely. Once you take the um, mounting bracket off, um, there are a couple of screws uh, sockets in the top as well that you can use to attach hardware to, uh, to mount things up. Um, that is a temperature uh, probe, so it does have water temperature in it, uh, but this is an all-in-one transducer. So it does everything, down vision, side vision, real vision 3D, high chirp, uh, also all the hypervision stuff as well all through here. Um, we also have a through hull version of this. So if you have a slightly bigger boat, if you've got inboard engines, so you just like having through hull transducers as opposed to transom mounts, uh, we have an HV300. Uh, it comes either as a single through hull all in one or as a pair of um, through hulls with left and right. So if you have a deep V boat, your side vision and uh, hypervision and 3D and all that uh, work quite nicely even with the deep V. Um, so looking at transducers for element S, let me bring another one over here into the field of view. 
So element S, as we mentioned before, doesn't have all the fancy fishing sonar, but it does have that really nice uh, chirp, high chirp, 170 to 230 kilohertz. Um, so we do have a wide range of transducer options for that. This is the most basic one right here. Uh, this is called a CPTS transom mount. So that is a single uh, chirp uh, transducer that is 170 to 230 kilohertz with a 25 degree beam width and a water temp sensor. And it can be mounted on the transom. There's usually a bracket attached to this to bolt it up. Um, we also have through hull versions of the CPTS. Um, this is just an example of one of them. Uh, this is a, again, uh, single frequency, or sorry, it's a chirp, 170 to 230 kilohertz with water temp. And this particular one is a zero degree transducer. Oops, zero degree meaning it is meant to install uh, vertically in the hull, pointing straight down. But we do also offer these as angled transducers. We have a 12 and a 20 degree version uh, to match the dead rise of your boat. So that enables you to mount this transducer into uh, a boat with an angled hull. Uh, but the elements inside are twisted uh, in the proper direction so that they actually shoot straight down, even when the transducer is at an angle. Um, so there is a pretty big selection of those available uh, in both plastic and bronze through hulls. All right, let me just check my notes. I wanna make sure that I didn't miss anything super important here. All right, let's take a look at some questions again. Aluizo, will there be the true and apparent wind at the same dashboard screen on Element. Uh, so Element does have a dashboard screen and it does have a sailing dashboard as well. Uh, you know what? I don't know what it shows for wind. So let's see if we can take a look. Uh, so what I'm gonna do, let's go back to the product cam here on this Element and we will learn together and see if it has what you're looking for. Um, I am just going to quickly add a new item. Let's see if I can get a dashboard. Yeah, we'll bring that one up. That's got dashboard. Now this is actually running a phishing profile. So I am going to bet you that most of the dashboard pages I'm going to see are probably not going to be wind related, but we'll take a quick look here. So here I have a split screen. I've got dashboard on the right. Um, notice I've got an orange box around the chart side of this. If I wanna get over here to the engine side, I open the menu and I can go up or down with my trackpad. And notice down here, it's got this switch to, and it'll switch to the other side. Instead of clicking 12 times to get all the way to the bottom, I'm gonna go up once and I just say, okay. And now I have actually switched to this page. Um, so let's see here, engine, navigation, rolling road, by data, data grid, customize. So I think what I'm gonna to need to do to fully answer your question is I'm gonna to need to swap this element into one of the sailing profiles. Let's see if I can do that without resetting the whole screen. There's a startup wizard that normally asks us what we want to do. Ah, here we go, oops, go back up here again. I went too far, right here. Demo type, fishing. Let's go to sailing. All right, now if we go into that dashboard page, I think we're gonna see some different things. Once again, I am gonna switch to the other side. I just go up and say, okay. And now I am on dashboard. So let's go down to the sailing dashboard page. All right, so this is Elements version of sailing dashboard. So we have true wind speed and direction, and you are looking for apparent wind speed. So I don't see that in here, but let me make a note. And what I will also do is I will check uh, tomorrow with our Element product manager. I will get an answer to your question and I will post it in the comments. All right, what else do we have in there? Let's see if we got another question. Dimitri, I find it difficult 
finding the right buttons at dark. Why not backlight? Okay, yes. So um, this is another question we do get uh, quite often on Element. So for those of you who do go boating at night, know that the, the keys on Element are not backlit. Um, that was a decision, I guess, that was made when the product was originally designed. Um, they thought maybe we could get away without backlighting. Um, but I will put you down as a fan of backlit keys so that uh, in future products, we will be sure to have them. But uh, Element does not have a uh, backlit uh, keyboard on it. Um, one thing you can do probably to help a little bit uh, is you can adjust the backlight of the screen. Uh, so if you have the screen really bright, it does make the, the keys difficult to see just because of the contrast. Um, if you want to adjust the backlighting in Element, just tap the power key and you have your display brightness control right here. And then with your trackpad, you can go left or right. And let me show you a little trick as well. There may be times when you dim the backlight all the way down. Oops, can you pop back to the product camera, please? Notice that this is very, very dim right now. I'm going to repeat this because I didn't realize you couldn't see it. I was looking at the product. Um, if you turn on your element and you had been out the night before and had it dimmed down very, very low, and maybe you get on board and you can't see it very well, uh, tap the power button repeatedly. Every time you tap it, the display brightness comes up by about 10%. And eventually it'll get to full power. Um, so let me show you again how to adjust the backlight. Um, this is similar to what you do on an Axiom or an Axiom Pro or an XL. XL, just tap the power key and you have a shortcut menu and display brightness is the first thing. The, the directional pad is just left or right. And you can set it to whatever level you like. Uh, and if you're out there at night, definitely run it down lower. That will certainly help with the key visibility. But I realize not having the backlighting uh, sometimes can be, uh, can be tricky uh, at night. Since we had it open, let's just take another look at what's in here as well. Um, you can take a screenshot. So if you want to capture what you see on the screen, uh, you can do that. Uh, you can uh, eject your SD card. If you're going to pull the card out while the system is turned on, you'll want to come in there and hit that command to eject the SD card. That just makes sure, makes sure that Element is done reading or writing from it um, before you pull the card out. It prevents it from damaging the SD card. Uh, we can change between the light and dark color scheme. We can turn the radar and the sonar on or off. And we can also power off the display uh, from here as well. And you'll notice that this shortcut menu uh, times out after about five seconds if you don't do anything with it and, uh, and it disappears. Um, all right, let me see what else I had in here. So we talked about favorites. We talked about the home screen. Um, there is a pretty neat feature in Element. It's called running mode, and it is available on all profiles. So whether you're in a powerboat profile or a sailing profile, um, what running mode does is it senses when the boat is picking up speed, and it automatically optimizes the chart display for high-speed running. Uh, so regardless of what heading mode you select, in running mode, it's going to bring you to a head-up orientation so that as you're looking at the chart, the chart view matches what you see through the windshield looking forward on your boat. Um, the other thing it does is it brings your primary data boxes um, up uh, to the left-hand side of the screen and puts them into a bigger font. And it also enlarges the size of items on the chart. So running mode is something that you can set up to happen automatically, or you can just choose it whenever you want. So I'm here in the chart application, um, and just it happens that in this chart window that we're in, it looks like it is not selected for the charts that I have plugged in. I have Navionics in here tonight, so let's just hit the button so we see some charts. So uh, let's say, for example, I put a waypoint in. I'm just going to go uh, over here, and I'm going to say OK. Oops, OK. And uh, let's just say go to. <clears throat> so my simulated boat here is now turning towards the waypoint, and it's going to head off. And in normal navigation mode, uh, it looks like I am in north up, which indicates down here in the corner. North is at the top of the screen, and it's just going just to stay that way uh, forever. Um, if I come into the menu, I'm going to come down here to settings and press OK. And I'm going to come over here to layers. And I'm going to turn on this function, automatically enter running mode. 
So when we're in auto running mode, you can see it already did it over here in the little preview window. And let me back up to show you what happened. Out here on the main chart display, it popped me into north up, or excuse me, into head up mode. It brought um, some key data boxes up very large so I can see them. So I've got the depth, I've got time to my next waypoint, distance to waypoint, uh, and ETA. Notice it's also bumped up the font size on my chart. In this case, it turned on the Navionics Easy View. So I'm going to be running fast. Um, I might be gunning it for my next fishing spot. Um, the automatic running mode is a pretty neat feature. Um, like I said, it works on any profile, so you can, uh, you can set it up in the sailing profile if you want. Um, if you can paddle really fast, uh, there is actually a kayak profile in here too, and running mode works there as well. Um, basically, it just senses the sudden change in speed when you're on the move, and it flips the display uh, automatically. And then when you slow back down, uh, it goes back to its previous mode of operation. So pretty neat little feature. Um, let me show you how some of the key uh, features work. So one of the things that everybody likes to do, right, is they like to drop waypoints on the go. So I think I mentioned at the beginning, we have a very large orange waypoint button up here on the top. So anytime I tap that button, it is going to log a waypoint into the system. Um, and that dialog pops up to show me that a waypoint was saved and then it times out if I don't do anything. Uh, but if I want to change the name or adjust the symbol while well, that dialog is present, I could pick a different symbol, for example, and I have now a waypoint with a different uh, symbol. Uh, I could drop another waypoint. I could go down and assign it a name or a group or all that other stuff while it's up here. So this works very similar to Axiom. The only difference is it's just not a touch interface. You're working entirely off the directional pad and your OK button over here. Directional pad, OK, and back. These are kind of your, your three friends over here. And they are sculpted so that you can feel them pretty well. You don't even necessarily have to see them. Just get your finger on the corner um, and, and you're off and running there. Um, so where do all these waypoints and routes go? Um, if we pop out here to the home screen, you'll notice there's a menu at the bottom. So if we want to see our waypoint list at any time, we can just pop right in. Waypoints, say OK. And similar to Axiom, we have Waypoint Manager. Uh, so here's all waypoints on the system, uh, just waypoints from today. Um, and then if I had waypoint groups, uh, I would have all the different group folders here. Uh, the grouping is a pretty neat feature. So if you have, uh, maybe you, you trailer your boat around to different lakes. Um, so you might have uh, a whole bunch of things for, for Lake Wachita, and you might have a whole bunch of waypoints for Smith Lake, and you might have a whole bunch of waypoints for Jones Lake. You can create folders, and those folders become waypoint groups, and you just assign all those waypoints to that group, and it keeps them nice and neat and, uh, and organized. Um, you can also use the groups other ways. You can use the waypoint groups maybe to categorize the type of fish that you caught, or uh, maybe it's different race courses. If you're using your element on a sailboat and you do some, uh, some evening racing, um, you can save all the waypoint positions for the race courses and keep them organized. So the waypoint groups um, are pretty neat. Um, you've got some other controls in here as well. This is how you would create a group. So you can create a group, uh, give it a name, and then you can assign waypoints to it. Uh, we can delete waypoints. We can uh, have individual groups either shown or hidden on the chart. Um, some people like to see all their waypoints all the time. Um, other boaters um, you know, collect thousands and thousands and thousands of waypoints, um, and they can overwhelm the chart presentation. So with this, you can come in and actually selectively turn on or turn off groups of waypoints that you don't need to see. Um, this is also a localized search, so you can actually find uh, waypoints uh, in a local area. So uh, some pretty neat stuff there in the, in the waypoint groups. And again, very similar to uh, Axiom operation, which is nice because many element owners also run Axiom on another boat. Um, so you'll find that the uh, operating systems are, are very common in uh, how they are laid out. Um, one last thing I wanted to point out is something called uh, chart selection. So um, another very common question we get with Element is what kind of charts can I run on it? Um, it's a smaller product. It's a, maybe a lower price product than Axiom. Um, is it hindered in any way in what it can do? The answer to that is no. <laughs> um, if, from a charting standpoint, um, you can run um, any of the charts that Axiom can run. So if you want to run Navionics or CMAP, that's fine. Lighthouse charts, uh, that is fine uh, as well. 
Uh, if you want to go to some of the real specialized uh, charts, like a Seymour or a Strike Lines chart, uh, that's totally cool as well. Navionics Platinum Plus uh, work great on here with all their satellite photos and all that sort of stuff. Um, Element has a quad core processor in it, just like Axiom. So you'll find, you know, anytime you're doing functions where you are rapidly changing the chart display, you can see just how quickly it responds. Uh, and that is that quad core processing in action. Um, so very, very quick uh, unit all around, um, really no restrictions on the types of charts uh, that you can use with it. Uh, looks like we're at quarter to the hour. So let's go back to some questions. Let's see what we got. Why is plotter sync not a feature enabled for the element? It makes things less efficient when dealing with trip planning. Also, can we get split ratio adjustments? Finally, depth shading. Chai City Yacker. All right, I have seen your videos. You have some awesome, awesome element content online. And thank you for putting that up and sharing it with everyone. Anybody that has an element and has not seen his YouTube channel, uh, definitely check it out. He's got some really cool videos. Uh, so as for plotter sync, uh, I, I'm not sure on that one. I'm gonna get back to you. Um, because this is a Navionics capable unit, I'm actually surprised that that is giving you problems. So let me check on that and I will post an answer in the comments. Um, as far as split ratio adjustments, uh, yes, that's a cool feature that uh, Axiom can do where we can shift the size of apps on the screen and give a little more screen to one thing or another. Um, that might be something we could do on Element. I can certainly uh, make that request to our software engineers and uh, depth shading as well. That's, yeah, that's another feature that we would like to get uh, across our platform. And I think our guys are actually having a look at that. So you, you may see some movement on that soon. Glenn would like to know, when running, my depth sometimes will not read. Do I need to adjust my transducer or is it just the nature of the beast when going over 4,200? I'm guessing that's 4,200 feet, maybe. Hopefully that's not miles per hour, but that would be pretty cool. I'd like to ride with you if you're going that fast. Um, so, um, if the water is that deep, uh, keep in mind that that sonar signal is going a very, very long distance. When you say 4,200, I'm guessing that's in feet. Um, so it does require a pretty powerful sonar to go 4,000 feet down. Um, many of our systems can do it. Um, more than likely though, if you're having trouble at speed with depth, what is probably happening is you are getting turbulence or cavitation on across your transducer. Let me just kind of hold this one up as an example, though it can happen on, on any of them. So your transducer is normally uh, either flush with the bottom of your boat. It could be in a fairing block, so it projects just a little bit out from the bottom of the boat, or it could be hanging off the transom. But when the water flows over the face of this transducer, we would like that water to basically remain crystal clear. Um, if there is any kind of air in that water flow, Air is the enemy of sound when it comes to sonar. Um, you may have seen, there's probably a YouTube video for this, but maybe if you took science in high school, there is a, um, uh, there, there was a uh, experiment they used to do in science class in physics where they would take a crystal vase and you'd lick your finger and you'd rub the rim and it makes the vase, uh, makes, makes the crystal, makes it harmonic sound, right? And it starts to ring and it's, there's water in the vase. And then they take an Alka-Seltzer tablet and they drop it inside and all of a sudden the sound just dies. Well, that's actually what happens on a sonar when the air gets over the face of the transducer. It actually blocks the signal. The sound signal actually cannot travel through air. It travels highly efficiently through water, uh, but not through air. Uh, so I suspect that um, if it's a speed related issue, it could be that. Um, if uh, 4200 refers to RPMs, and my producer man uh, slipped me a note. Thank you, Mr. Producer Man. If, uh, if it is a speed related, like an RPM related thing, it could be an electrical noise issue. So I would double check that you have your system grounded uh, properly. Um, most Raymarine units have a drain wire on their power cord. Uh, some displays have additional grounding points on the chassis of the display. Uh, or the sounder module, uh, do make sure you have all the grounds connected because you could be getting electrical noise up in there. Um, and at, especially at deep, uh, deep depths or high speeds, um, that's when the sonar is working its hardest um, and it really, really has to listen for the signal coming back and electrical noise could be uh, blocking that. 
if you're not using an NMEA 2000 connection, does the pigtail on the power cable need to be terminated with an NMEA 2000 terminator? Uh, it does not. If you're not using it, um, the pigtail on the end uh, doesn't, doesn't need to have anything plugged into it. Uh, if it's going to be exposed to the weather, it's probably a good idea to cap it uh, somehow. Um, so I would even just consider uh, at a real basic level, put some electrical tape over the end of it. Um, maybe put a little bit of dielectric grease in it first, just to uh, grease up those pins and protect them from the air. Uh, but otherwise, it does not need to be uh, terminated uh, if it's not being used. Um, if you're plugging into an active NMEA 2000 network, that network overall will have terminators uh, in it uh, that define the end of the network. Justin, I get a lot of interference in 3D mode. It shows hundreds of fish targets. How do I adjust it to clear it up fishing in saltwater? All right, Justin, um, you might be getting a little bit of wake turbulence showing up. Um, what I would suggest, though, is um, uh, playing with the gain on the sonar. And let me, on the our demo product here, uh, first I'm going to actually go back and just change my uh, simulator back from sailing to, we'll go to coastal fishing. That's just going to give us the most sonar options. All right. So I'm going to go into my fish finder. And let's go into 3D mode. And we'll give it just a second for the 3D mode to load up. And I think I know what you are talking about. You are seeing uh, even bigger clouds than this. You're probably getting very consistent, even maybe U-shaped clouds. So some of what you're picking up there could be valid targets. Uh, some of it could be wake or turbulence. So if there's bubbles in the water, it will actually pick that up. Uh, but um, you do have some controls um, to do that. So if you go into the menu, so I just hit the menu button here, I come down to adjust a sensitivity. And here I have gain. Um, I also have, oops, so I can open the gain menu up. There we go. So the system normally runs in automatic gain mode. Um, and we have this notion of automatic plus a little bit of fudge factor, right? So what I would start with is leave it in auto mode, but bump it up or down a little bit. So this is automatic plus 3%. In your, in your case, if you're getting noise, you're going to go the other way. You're going to go down. So maybe automatic, you know, take away 10, 15% and see how that looks cleaning up your picture. So what this does is it allows the auto tune to keep running in the background, but then it always subtracts about 12% of the gain out. See how that does for you. You could also go into a fully manual mode as well. Um, there's some other settings in there as well, and these are similar to our other products. Uh, so we had gain. We also have uh, sensitivity. And again, it runs in automatic. You can add or subtract a little bit and maintain auto mode. You can also shift to the right here. This looks like a, looks like a standard transmission here. And now you can go into manual mode, and you have full manual control, in this case, of our intensity uh, settings. This is uh, intensity uh, is basically how bright it colorizes uh, the targets coming back. Um, also in here, we have the surface filter. The surface filter um, works to eliminate wake noise uh, and turbulence from water chop at the surface. Uh, so you could play with that uh, as well. Um, and like all of our sonar products, this is one of my favorite buttons here, this last one, all to auto. So you can come in here and you can tweak and tune and uh, get it looking its best, or uh, you could get it looking its worst. Um, then you always have that button to bail you out. Um, so we go in here to adjust sensitivity. You can come down here to all to auto. And what it's going to do is it's going to put everything back to factory defaults, back to automatically controlled tuning. So I just say yes. And you can even see in the simulated image here, it, uh, it has changed all those parameters back and it's automatically managing everything. So you don't have to be afraid of tuning and tweaking. You always have that uh, option to bail you out. We've got a lot of good comments in here tonight. Shank Thomas, mount your transducer dead even with the hull. That'll give you the best outcome. Any exposed surface will kick air out of the water. That is true. So when you're mounting your transducer, and let me hold this one up. This is a pretty good 
example, this is an RV100. If we can go back to the studio cam for a second there, Mr. Producer. So here's an RV100. What Shank is talking about here is this is going to be mounted on the transom of the boat. And then the bottom of the boat is going to be around here somewhere. Um, a good place to kind of start with placing a transom mounted transducer is to get the this bottom surface um, even with the bottom of the boat. That's a good starting point. Um, and then you're going to take it for a test ride, see how it rides. And what he's talking about is if the transducer is set too low, um, it's going to become a place for cavitation to develop. It's going to, there's going to be drag um, produced on the front of the transducer, and that actually causes a low pressure uh, area, and air actually um, comes out of the water, and then the bubbles will stream down the transducer and kill your sonar signal. Um, there is some tunability built into the position of the transducer. So when you look at this bracket, uh, I'm going to show it to you head on. Um, you can notice that there are three holes in it. Two of them are slotted and one of them is round. So when you're mounting a transit mount transducer for the very first time, you're only going to do two screws in it initially, and that's going to be your slotted screws. And what you, when you sink these into the transom of the boat, you want to leave, um, you want to have the screws basically start in the middle of these slots. And that's going to allow you to move the transducer up a little bit or down a little bit if you need it, because there is going to be some fine tuning involved. Um, in addition to adjusting the height of the transducer and how high or low it is in relation to the bottom, you can also adjust the transducer's running angle. Um, so we have a bolt here in the side that can be loosened up, and then we can swivel this bracket uh, up or down. Um, depending on how your boat rides in the water, if you ride bow high all the time, keep in mind that your transducer is going to ride bow high. So you might need to trim it up uh, a little bit to compensate for that. Uh, some boats, it actually pays to put the uh, tail into the transducer a couple degrees down, um, and that it allows them to uh, image a little better. Um, it varies a lot from boat to boat. It depends on what you have um, in terms of steps and fairings and um, other appendages on the bottom of the hull. Um, but that's kind of a good start. Um, you want to leave that adjustability in there with the slots. And then when you get your transducer tuned up right and you're happy with it, that's when you come back with the third screw. And the third screw is basically a lock screw to lock the, lock the height in. That's trans amount transducer. So we're getting very close to the end of the hour. And I think we maybe have time for one more question. Lenny has a seven inch Raymarine GPS fish finder sonar. Is there any way to get the downloads for the chip for it? I got a couple of them in the beginning, but missed the rest of them. Uh, GPS fish finder there, the downloads for the chip for it. I got a couple. Okay. I think what you're looking to do, Larry, is to update the software in your unit or maybe update your navigation chart. I'm not quite sure which way, but either way, I think we've got you covered. Um, so your, um, your Raymarine products, obviously they are very fancy computers that head out onto the water. And like all computers, they do get updated from time to time. Um, so we do have provisions in the products to update the software. Um, we um, can connect them either to the internet uh, when you're at the dock or at home, and you can pull the software down into the unit that way and bring it up to date. Uh, or you can go to our website, go to raymarine.com slash support. You'll see a link there for software updates. And you just pick your product out and you can actually pull the file down and then program it onto a micro SD memory card at home and just bring it down to the boat and plug it into your display. Um, Element like Axiom can update peripherals that are attached uh, to it as well. So you, you can uh, update other things in addition to your element um, that are on the uh, NEMA 2000 uh, network. Um, if it's your chart that you're trying to update, uh, Navionics charts uh, can be updated online, um, as can our new Lighthouse charts, but you probably don't have those yet. Uh, not many people have them yet, so I think you probably have Navionics um, if you've got charts. Uh, if you go to Navionics.com, there's a link right on the top of their website to activate or update my chart. Um, you will uh, follow that link. Um, you plug your chart into your computer, and they basically will do a scan on it through the internet. Um, and tell you what updates are available for it. So hopefully that gets you pointed in the right direction, Larry. But if it doesn't, leave another comment or send us a uh, private message. 
Um, so um, there was actually one question that came in right at the beginning. And since we're right at the end, I'm going to take that one. And it's that one from Alan Goosen. Because um, this is a little bit of a carryover question from last week. Someone had asked about this as well. And I actually have it set up here. Um, so this is not an element question. This is an axiom question. So we're deviating here for the last, uh, the last question of the night. Uh, but he wants to know on an, his Axiom Pro 12, um, it's got Bluetooth on it. And that has, it supports Bluetooth audio. And he wants to be able to hear his alarms from the system uh, on a Bluetooth speaker or a Bluetooth device. Um, he's getting sound from the Netflix app. He's probably getting sound from other apps. It's got Spotify and other things like that. Um, but he can't get it to interact with the speaker. Um, so what I wanted to show you, Alan, was this. I set this up when I saw the question come in right before the broadcast. Um, I do have an Axiom here at the ready. And um, when you have Bluetooth devices connected to Axiom that support audio, um, you actually get this extra volume control in the shortcut menu. Um, so just to kind of show you how I did this overall, uh, up here in the corner, I go to menu, I go to Bluetooth settings, and you can see um, I actually have, um, I, didn't, I didn't have a Bluetooth speaker with me, but I have this Axiom uh, paired with uh, a Bluetooth headset. So it's uh, standing in uh, in lieu of a Bluetooth speaker, but it pairs the same way. So you can see I'm connected to an audio device. And now that I'm connected to an audio device, um, anytime I go into this shortcuts menu, I have this volume control. And with Bluetooth devices, we have a volume slider for apps and we have a volume slider for alarms. So I suspect, Alan, that maybe the alarm volume is turned down on your system and you're not hearing it. Uh, so definitely go in and take a look there. Um, if that doesn't get you pointed in the right direction, definitely put a comment in and uh, I'll try to chase it down for you. So I think that is where we are gonna wrap it tonight. I hope you enjoyed our everything element or mostly element session. Um, I wanna thank you all for coming out again and joining us on this Thursday night. And again, for those of you who didn't watch the live broadcast, but you're watching this over the weekend or in the coming days, uh, know that I wanna answer all your questions too. So definitely pop a comment in down below, uh, post your questions and I do go in there after the broadcast and try to answer everything and stay up on it uh, through the coming week. Um, we are going to be back with our next Raymarine Live in two weeks. Uh, we're going every other week for the next uh, little bit of the summer. Uh, so do plan to come back in two weeks. We will have some details about that broadcast uh, coming out shortly. We're trying to put something special together for you, but I'm not going uh, to spoil the fun just now. But it'll be pretty cool uh, if it all comes together. So definitely uh, plan to tune in for our next Raymarine Live. So until I see you again, thank you for joining us. Thank you for choosing Ray Marine. I hope to see you out on the water soon. Thank you and good night.